now. So you're all being recorded, just so you know. And uh, if you have uh, an issue with that, you can turn your camera off or whatever. And um, whoop, can whoop, cancel. I admit, we got two more people in the waiting room. And uh, so anyhow, my name is Jeff Hester. I'm the founder of SoCal Hiker and the SoCal Hikers group on Facebook. And um, uh, I'm joining tonight from our home in Bend, Oregon, of course. You know, where else would a SoCal Hiker be but Oregon? Um, we, we have a home up here and we're looking to eventually retire here. So that's, that's my goal. And so we're up here full time right now. And um, uh, it's great because I get a chance to explore the Pacific Northwest a lot, a little bit more and, and uh, discover places like that. I just found out today that I'm going to be uh, joining some friends from Southern California on a trek up Mount Adams in 10 days. So I'm really stoked about that. Um, and, uh, and then I've got uh, another trip planned for the early part of September, so a backpacking trip. I'm looking forward to and I'll share more about that later but let's kick things off with a toast to uh, backpacking and the joys of getting outdoors so cheers everybody thanks for joining tonight Cheers. and uh, I gotta do my screenshot thing so get, your, get, get it up there wait a second I gotta one more time uh, da, 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 da. full screen ready go <laughs> okay we got it too many things, you know, too many balls in the air at one, one time. So uh, backpacking, beginning backpacking gear. I got a quick poll to ask to kind of kick things off. And that is, what's your backpacking experience? So take a look at that. Let me know, you know, sort of what your, what your background is. And maybe we'll find somebody else to lead tonight's session <laughs> with even more experience. <laughs> All right, so uh, we got 75% of the votes in, or the the uh, poll people have responded. If you haven't quite yet, please do so. Get those in. I wait another couple seconds here. And while I'm doing that, um, I see we have some other people on here. Mike, Alejandro, Brenda, uh, thanks for joining tonight. I really appreciate you being a part of our happy hour. All right, let's end the poll. And we have about half of the folks on the, the happy hour have never gone backpacking. Uh, about 20% have gone once or twice. 20% have several trips under their belt. and. And, and one person has been backpacking for years, and that doesn't include, I don't get to vote because I'm not on there. So uh, that'd be a couple people who's been, so Amy, that was you, okay. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Uh, when did you start backpacking, Amy? Probably 10 years ago. Okay, awesome. I'd like to get more trips in, but I've probably gone backpacking at least once a year for those 10 years. Yeah. Um, but the last trip I did was actually a 22 day road trip and it was technically car camping, but I used all my backpacking gear. So does that count? Okay, yeah, well, it's- <laughs> Didn't include in the, that in the, in the 10 years of experience. It's, but, it's backpacking adjacent. <laughs> yes, it's a tangent of it. So, but I try and go at least once a year for the last 10 years. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I started backpacking when I was in Boy Scouts a long time, this was a long time ago, a long time ago. So it was in the 70s. Um, and, uh, but when I, in 1978, we moved from, I was born in Southern California, but we moved to the Midwest when I was five. We moved back when I was 16 to Southern California. And I had done some backpacking in Indiana of all places, which is kind of a crummy place to go backpacking, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it's nice, it's pretty, but there's not mountains, you know, like there are in Southern California and other places around the country. And so um, I got connected with some friends and some uh, folks who were really into backpacking. 
as a teenager. And I just, I was just in love with the mountains. I loved it. And so I started backpacking uh, in the, you know, 70, really backpacking in like 78, 79. And in 1980, I took my first through hike of the John Muir Trail. And I actually have my backpack still from that trip. And I'm going to show it to you. So this is a uh, this is an external frame uh, backpack, oh, yeah. and my mom sewed this backpack. Wow! So she back then there used to be a company called Frostline, and they would sell uh, you know, like a whole kit which had the buckles and the zippers and the pattern, and then you could go buy. The material, so she bought this, you know, ripstop nylon stuff, and she actually sewed this entire thing, which has got like five pockets on it, and zippers, and buckles, and all kinds of, you know, strap-on places and things like that. So, um, you know, a place to connect it to the the frame. It's crazy. And, and she did, of course, she did swear she would never do that again, you know, <laughs> but um, I can't, I can't give this away because of the sentimental value and I, I, I don't want to use it either because it's just, <laughs> it's not very comfortable compared to what we have today. Um, so I've been backpacking for years. There was a lot of, when my kids were young, we would do probably one, you know, decent sized backpacking trip each summer. Uh, but, oh, and we got more people coming in, and, uh, uh, and then uh, once my kids, you know, got older, I started getting back into it again and doing longer trips, and I've done a number of things over the years, so, which brings me to our second poll question, and this is really for the folks who, um, who have experience backpacking, so not everybody has to answer this, but what is your longest backpacking trip? It, not, not in terms of miles, but in terms of the number of nights. Because um, I think that's really the, the hardship factor. Miles are, can be hard, but it's, you know, how many days are you out in the wilderness and, you know, going without a shower and a toilet and all of those things. The things we take for granted, you know. Um, I'm watching the results come in. We've got uh, a pretty good distribution. A lot of people have done, about 38% have done three night trips is the most. 25% uh, have done overnight trips. That's a lot. Nobody's done more than 10 nights. <laughs> I have. My longest trip is... 25 days. Oh, wow. Days. Was that the John Muir Trail? That was the first time I did the John Muir Trail. The second time I did it was in 2010. And uh, my wife and I did it. She was my girlfriend at the time, my wife now. Uh, we did it in 22 days. So we actually did it a little bit you know, quicker. Um, and, and honestly, so it was really kind of fun to do 30 years apart because it was 1980 in 2010 um it had you know this i remembered the trail you know it's like i remember the scenery i remember the views i remember you know different places along the way and i was like it was such a really great experience to be able to share that with somebody that was important to me mm -hmm. and um uh, obviously a lot had changed you know the technology of the gear has changed tremendously and it's you know things are things are you know, much lighter, they're much more comfortable, um, you know, sleeping systems are much more comfortable. There's just, you know, a whole, you know, big change and a positive one in, in gear. And so I'm going to end the poll here and we'll share the results just to see, uh, so you can see, you know, kind of the distribution is pretty, pretty uh, even, evenly distributed. Most people, three nights is sort of their longest backpacking trip. A few people have done a little bit more um, and a few a little bit less. 
And I know some of you haven't backpacked at all yet, so that, that's okay. Um, hopefully we can whet your appetite and give you some, some good advice to uh, get started. Hmm. So let me stop that, close the poll. And um, I'll stock, I'll, I wanna start by just sharing sort of the, the basics for the three main systems that you need to be concerned about for backpacking. Uh, the first is, of course, your pack itself, you know, what you're going to carry, you know, your stuff in. And um, you generally don't need a whole lot of bells and whistles on a pack. Um, but there's, and there's a range of things that are available. Usually what you'll see when you're looking at packs is the, the volume that it can, can carry listed in liters. So you see 55 liters or 65 liters, that sort of thing. So that's how much it's going to carry. And um, you need to just think about like, what, how long am I going to be out? And do I really need that giant pack? Or will something, you know, a little bit smaller fit? I'll give you a couple of examples. Oh. Um, I really like, I really like Osprey uh, packs. They make uh, both a, every one of the models comes, they have two different names. So they have a men's version and a women's version, and it's designed to fit the body a little bit differently. And if you go to a, a, a good outdoor store, like an REI or something similar to that, um, they have, you know, people who can fit this to your body frame precisely. So they have the tools there and the know-how to adjust, you know, where the straps fall, especially on the shoulder back here and, uh, and all of that. Now this particular pack is an Exos. So it's kind of a lightweight, um, it's got, you know, smaller straps and it's an Exos 58. So it's not a super, I wouldn't take this on a, a week long trip, but I would take it on a two or three night trip, absolutely. You know, and it's it's going to be lightweight and it's going to do the job for me. Um, some of the things that I like about it, it is essentially an internal frame. Although if you look closely, there is actually, you can see, um, you know, on this outside, you can see a part of the frame is actually exposed here. And then there's like a, um, a, a firm, plastic rib that goes between these those two uh, vertical members. And then there's a mesh backing that holds the pack away from your back. So air can get back there and you don't get all hot, as hot and sweaty as you might. Um, you know, this one, you know, usually these packs have a lot of nice little features like uh, pockets on the um, hip belt. So you have a little zipper pocket to get access to you know, trail snacks or a camera or whatever it might be right there. And also they have pockets on the shoulder straps too, right on the front. So you can have, you know, like your cell phone or your whatever right there. Um, the other thing that's really kind of cool about these pack, these Osprey packs, is they have a special loop on the back and a loop on the, the front strap, on the left front strap, that's for trekking poles. And so you can stow your trekking poles without having to stop and take your pack off and stuff them in a pocket. So basically, if you know, sometimes I'll, I, I generally use trekking poles. And by the way, I like, the, I like those Cascade Tech poles that they have at Costco for 30 bucks, the, the carbon fiber with the cork handle. Um, I used to have some black diamond poles that were carbon fiber that were like four times as expensive. And they're basically the same. They're virtually identical. Even if I break a pair of Cascade Tech poles you know, and buy, have to buy another one, it's not a big deal. So um, I, I like those poles, but you know, whatever poles you have, uh, sometimes I use them and sometimes I just like to stow them. I want my hands free to be able to take pictures or something else. And uh, so I can just collapse them down and I can stow it on those straps without having to take my pack off and stop what I'm doing. Yeah. So yeah. that's can always a nice a, thing. Can I make a suggestion really quick but like that we mute our mics? Because every time somebody makes a noise, the screen doesn't show you. 
I'm, I'm going to, uh, um, okay, so two things. One, I'm going to mute everybody, but you can unmute yourself. So if you have a question or somebody wants to say something, you can unmute yourself. I'm going to do that right now. And then the second thing, there's two ways of viewing um, everybody so that like the view that I'm looking at right now is the, what they call the grid view. So I see, it's like the Brady Bunch, you know, I see everybody. I see Tara and Cecilia and Christy and, or Tara and uh, Cecilia and Christy and Amy and Catherine and Chris and George and, and so on. So um, it depends on what you'd like. If you wanna see, you know, the details of the, year that I'm sharing, you can do that. Or if you want to see everybody at once, you can do that as well. So, okay. Um, thanks for the suggestion, Catherine. So that, that's, this is, you know, like a lighter pack that I would use on a shorter trip. On longer trips, I have um, a bigger pack. This is a, uh, an Atmos 65, AG. The AG stands for anti-gravity, which is a little bit of an oversell. Um, it, <laughs> I wish that it was anti-gravity. It's supposed to make you feel like it's lighter than air or something. I don't know. But um, uh, this, this pack actually has a lot of bells and whistles, way more than you probably need, but it's super comfortable. I can load it really heavy if I want to, and I can carry a lot of stuff, and it's, it's going to work for me. And inside here, stuck in here, I've got um, a friend of mine uh, has an ultralight pack from Hyperlight Mountain Gear, and it's basically just a tube with a couple of mesh pockets on the sides and uh, really lightweight straps, and it's super, super, super light. But you can't, you know, which is great, as long as all the rest of your gear is also super light. And so I don't generally recommend that as if you're just starting out and just starting to get gear, you probably don't want to go that, that way. You want to do something a little more, you know, middle of the road, um, like the Osprey or, um, you know, if you want to go lightweight, they have models that are like the Exos, which is a little more lightweight. Um, and, and start with that. And then as you get more experience, you're gonna find, hey, uh, you know, I, I really wanna, you know, do this more and I wanna do it, you know, lighter and I wanna go a certain way. You'll develop a style for backpacking and you can kind of fine tune your gear over time in that way. Um, so backpacks, those are my, you know, sort of tips about backpacks. Any other thoughts or questions about backpacks? Be sure to unmute yourself. Say I've used like both a regular or unisex pack and having a women's specific pack made a huge difference. So for anyone that hasn't yet purchased a pack, I highly recommend, you know, as a woman that you make sure you do invest in a women's specific pack. It makes a huge difference. What, like, what pack do you have, Amy? I have an Osprey. I'd have to go pull it out to look at the exact model. It's not a huge one. So um, like my sleeping pack and everything packs down really, really tiny. Um, but it just may, it just fits significantly different. And, you know, I'm average, you know, five, five, 110 pounds. So I'm not super tall or super short or anything, but it, it just made a huge difference. Awesome. That's good to hear. Yeah. And, and Osprey is one of the brands that kind of, they make a point of having the male and female different, you know, styles. I would agree with that. Um, but can you recommend like for how long the trip, what size backpack, like four days, 65 liter, three, is there a yes, no? <laughs> yeah, you don't need a 65 liter for four days. You can probably get by with 55 liters somewhere around there. Um, okay. I, don't, I can't ring off the top of my head sort of what the chart looks like. And part okay. of it's going to depend on a couple of other factors. Like, for example, are you, if you're in the Eastern Sierras, I know Tara has a trip planned on the Big Secchi Loop. Oh, and she's going to be in Kings Canyon and, and uh, Sequoia National Parks. 
and there's bears there and they have a requirement for bear proof containers. And so, um, yeah, those containers totally like put a whole new wrench in packing your pack. <laughs> if you were have, if having to carry, this is this is a good one for a few, like three or four nights. That's the one I have. Max. <laughs> I have a, a taller one that's, you know, like the, this is the, uh, the BV450 and I have another one that's, I forget what, the BV800 or something. And it's almost twice as tall. And you can imagine, you know, this is, it doesn't compress, you know, <laughs> it's hard and it takes up a lot of space. And so like, depending on the pack, you might have to insert it, you know, this way. If you're lucky, you can insert it this way, or, you know, sometimes you can strap it on the back of your power on the top of your pack, or, you know, there's different ways of dealing with that, but that's going to make a difference. You know, if you don't have to deal with this, you can just have a stuff sack that makes a huge, huge right. difference. Um, and it also depends on the weather. You know, are you in cold weather? You need a, you know, head a lot more layers and that sort of thing. So you want to, uh, you know, that's going to take more space. So it's, there's not a hard and fast rule for the size. It's, it's going to be dictated by some of the gear that you bring along. But I will, um, I will share a couple of resources towards the end that will, you know, help you make those decisions about, you know, like what kind of, um, you know, how, what kind of, what size pack to get and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing I'll mention is I, I've got a couple of these um, REI bags. This is a, it's called a flash. And you can see I've got my one of my six pack of peaks uh, patches sewn on there or ironed on there. But um, this is super, it's pretty lightweight. There's no really, there's no frame at all. It's just, you know, you can just mash it up into a little ball if you wanted to. It's a day pack and it's a small day pack at that. This one's an 18 liter pack. And basically what I'll do is I'll, I'll sometimes bring one of these along and use it as a stuff sack for some of my gear or my food or whatever, my clothes maybe. And, um, and then, you know, store this with my stuff in it, in my pack. The reason I would do that is because I might set up camp somewhere on a beautiful lake in the Sierra Nevada. And I decide, well, this afternoon, I wanna go hike up that peak right over there, but I don't wanna, go without you know the 10 essentials and a first aid kit and you know water and all that and i don't also i don't want to carry this whole thing so i have something that i can bring you know that's it takes it adds a little bit of weight but um yeah you know it's pretty pretty light it has a hip belt it has a sternum strap it's got a lot of those kind of features already on it and uh, even has a sleeve for a, hydra a hydration bladder, if that's what you like to use for water. Um, I don't. So another little bit of advice, I like to use the plain old Nalgene bottles or a smart water bottle, something like that. Um, anyhow, that's, a, that's another little tip that I'll use. And then, and then sometimes even on just regular day hikes, I'll bring something, I'll bring like this, because if I don't, have a lot of layers that I need to carry or a lot of extra gears, gear and things, I can, I can get by with a small pack like that. So it's a nice, uh, a nice little extra. Um, uh, Cecilia had a great question about, you know, sort of the, how do you decide the size of pack that you need? And is, are there some guidelines? And so I'll just share with you now, uh, one of the resources that I really like, um, for just kind of sizing up gear in general. And I have two more people to admit to the group. All right. Uh, is uh, Andrew Skirka's Ultimate Hiker's Gear Guide. And there's a second edition out right now, and I'm gonna share a link to it. It's like eight bucks for the paperback on Amazon. So let me just real quickly give you that link. Um, And I'll paste it in the chat. 
So there it is. That's the um, um, the ultimate hiker's gear guide. It, the the second this is the first edition. The second edition just came out. It's three years old, but it's still you know pretty valid stuff. So it talks about those different. It talks about the systems that we're talking about tonight and a whole lot more because it also goes into you know the things that you wear and the boots and trail running shoes and all of those things. So Cecilia, check that one out. I think that'll be a, a useful one. Hi, Rachel. I've got everybody muted right now. So if you want to talk, you'll have to unmute yourself. But um, I mute myself anyway the whole time. So hi. <laughs> okay, the, the next thing that's important to me is getting a good night's sleep. And so there's a couple of fu functions to that. And um, one is your sleep system. Um, I have, I just brought up one particular bag that I have that I really, really like. Um, this is, and this is not how I normally store it. So um, when you get a sleeping bag, there, it usually comes with two bags. Uh, there's a stuff sack that you use or you can use on the trip. You don't have to do that. If a lot of times your backpack will have a compartment for the sleeping bag. You can save weight by just not bringing a stuff sack and just stuff the bag into that compartment. And then it usually comes with a mesh bag like you see here. I don't know if you can, you can see my hand sort of behind the mesh there or in the mesh. And it's a much bigger bag so that it's not compressed. In this case, it's a down, uh, this is a down bag. And so when I want to carry it on a trip, I can stuff this down really 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 small because it compresses you know really well um but if you don't want to store it that way for a long period of time or it's going to lose that loft and that ability to keep you warm what i what i normally try to do is you'll see on the the foot end usually of the sleeping bags a couple of loops like this, okay? And so normally what I do is I hang this, I use a carabiner or whatever, and I hang it vertically, just like you would see an REI, in a closet or in my garage, you know, from a shelf. And so now, you know, there's no compression at all. It's, you know, staying nice and fluffy and uh, it's in really good, you know, shape. Now, the this particular sleeping bag there you know you'll see uh sleeping bags generally have a comfort rating you know the temperature that they're rated as comfortable to so like it might be thir a 30 would be comfortable down to 30 degrees you have to kind of throw that out and and try it because um one there is no true standard for measuring how warm a sleeping bag keeps people so it's an, a guesstimate as bet at best and sometimes it's a marketing thing you know if they say oh it's really comfortable down to 20 degrees or whatever maybe maybe not you have to try it and and see um which and another this is another plug for rei rei has a return policy that is super liberal so that um, if you were to, you know, get this bag and you were to try it, you took it out on a trip and you found it, oh, I was freezing in this bag, you know, I need something warmer. You can return it to REI. They give you the full, you know, value of what you paid and you can try a different one. So, um, you know, even though the, the, the you know, the prices aren't necessarily going to be the cheapest at REI that policy alone makes it worthwhile when you're just kind of starting out and you're figuring out what you like or what you don't like. Now, um, this particular bag that I use, this is one of my favorite three season bags. They call it a three season bag. It's good basically spring through fall. So it's not for winter mountaineering or snow camping, that kind of thing. And this bag um, is by Sierra Designs and it's called uh, the Backcountry Bed. And it doesn't have a zipper. So the thing that's kind of cool about it is that, I'm not gonna, I, I won't get in it, but um, basically it's sort of a mummy shape with this big opening here. 
And then it has like a quilt that comes up and you can tuck it in. You can stick your hands in here if you want to keep your hands warm and, and have your have it down, you know, around your waist or whatever you want. So it's kind of a hybrid between halfway between a full mummy bag and something like a, a quilt. Um, the next bag that I get, and I've got to admit a couple more people to the room. The next bag that I get will probably be a quilt. And uh, Tara, you just got a quilt. Is that correct? For yes, your trip? I ordered about 10 weeks ago. They're, they're no longer <laughs> taking orders for about eight weeks. Loco Libra. It's a small company and uh, a friend of mine is very ultralight and I, I'm not ultralight, but I needed to lighten up a bit for my trip. And um, I mean, they will take orders again for in um, I think eight weeks, but it's 14 ounces. That's and, super light. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the 20 degrees and my sleeping bag was 20 degrees and I have an insert um, and I, I slept in 18 degree weather in the snow with a parka and I was okay. Okay. A and that's the other, you know, that's sort of the trade off. So, um, like even this bag, there's no insulation on the, on the, on the bottom. So it's designed, there's a sleeve where you put your sleeping pad, you insert the sleeping pad into the bag. And if you're sleeping in, you know, someplace where it's cold, you might want to get an insulated sleeping pad. And then that provides your, you know, your warmth there. And your, your, because generally, you know, if you were to put uh, down on the bottom anyways, you're, once you flatten it down with the weight of your body, it's not going to have much insula insulating value anyways. So, I used uh, my Neolite one and then I put, I can't remember the Thermarest, the one that kind of like looks like the eggshell that people that one yes this one so i i put both of them so i was okay <laughs> so yeah. uh this is a thermo thermo z light this is also really really light as a as a pad um and it's got sort of a this is kind of you know weathered now but it's got sort of a reflective side so the theory is that it's going to reflect your body heat if you if you lay it down with the silver side facing up, it's gonna reflect your body heat and, and generate some additional heat that way. Um, this was really great when I was 18. It's not so great for me now. <laughs> I mean, I can do it for like a night, you know, or two maybe, but I won't sleep as well because I like to sleep on my side sometimes. You know, I flip flop around through my back, my side and my stomach. And um, definitely if you're a side sleeper, this isn't gonna cut it. Um, so the other thing that I use, and where'd it go? Ah, here it is, is an air mattress. And there's a bunch of different air mattresses. This is a Big Agnes um, Q-Core. And uh, they're, they, they've gotten really sophisticated. This particular one is an older one, still functional, but I have to blow it up with my mouth, you know, and it takes, you know, three minutes or whatever for me to inflate it. Uh, but it's four inches thick in the end. It is super, super comfortable. I can sleep on my side. I can, talk, you know, flip around back and forth and I'll be fine. And um, uh, they, the newer ones have a special bag that it comes in that also allows you to inflate without, you know, blowing this whole time. So basically, you just kind of scoop the air up with it, and then you 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 roll up the uh, inflating bag to inflate the the pad. So it saves you from hyperventilating in the high altitude. <laughs> Um, but those are the sort of the two components of your sleep system is your pad and your bag. And as Tara said, you know, this is sometimes useful if you are tend to be cold, you might use this in conjunction with an air mattress. And so uh, when I've done uh, winter camping 
on the snow, I'll bring one of these and an air mattress. So I'll have this between the snow and my and my uh, my air mattress, and then my air mattress is what I my bag is on. But um, the other thing that they have, they have a smaller version of these, and looks you can well yeah, it's much smaller. This is just a sit pad. It's called the Z seat, and it's a super nice thing to have for day hikes because you can. You know, if you're if there's snow or if there's rocks or whatever, it's just nice to have something cushy to sit down on, and you know, I don't know, and it weighs no, almost nothing. You know, it's really really light. So, any other tips or advice for sleep systems? I will just add my first um, sleeping bag was again a unisex bag, which meant it was much longer than I was, and the excess air inside your bag means you're going to be colder and you have to warm all of that air with your body heat. So what I would do is I would put my clothes inside the sleeping bag at my feet. So it takes up that air and it was less for me to have to warm. Since then I have a women's specific zero degree bag, so I'm fine wherever I go, but that really helped me in the beginning when I was, you know, getting gear and like getting used to all the backpacking stuff. So it made a big difference there too, just putting my clothes at the end of the bag. Which has the added benefit of your clothes is warm in the morning too. <laughs> so do you ever use liners inside your sleeping bag? Great question, Cecilia. Um, I've, I have like a silk liner that I've used. I tend to run hot. And so I'm always trying to stick my feet out or, you know, keep my arms out anyways, you know, and, um, but my, my wife tends to run cold. And so um, she'll oftentimes use a liner. The other benefit of using a liner like that, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't weigh a whole lot. It's going to add some weight, but um, it's also going to keep your bag clean. Um, you know, I mean, if you're out there for one night, not a big deal, but if you're out there for multiple days, you know, or a week or 20 days, you know, you get a little grimy. And even though you can, you know, kind of, you know, wash yourself off in a creek or whatever, you're still, you know, you've got uh, body oils and things like that that are getting on the, the material over time. Um, if it's not too warm out, what I'll usually do is have a, um, a pair of uh, Patagonia uh, a base layer that runs all the way, you know, basically a full, like tights, essentially. Um, and, uh, and then that, that kind of keeps my body filth away from the bag right. itself. And it also provides another layer of insulation. So that's another way of doing it. So are the liners, um, cause like some of them are rated to bring that, like you can use it for 20 degrees colder and still be comfortable in your bag. Is that the same as the sleeping bags that it's, it's a just guesstimate. Best? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something you just have to try and see, you know, how it works for you. I have this Sea to Summit one that's 25. It, it says it adds 25. It doesn't add 25 degrees, but <laughs> I like it because it's softer. And even last week on a trip, I, I tend to run hot. So I sleep on top of my sleeping bag with the, the liner is cooler. Mm. So, and when it was really cold, I put the liner on my dog. So. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, so it feels like the Sea to Summit one, it feels, it's like, I don't know how to describe them. It's kind of like microfiber almost, between that and cotton somewhere. So it, it just, it's cozier. That's a really good point. Um, you know, the, the feeling that you get from different materials, some of it feels really nice against your body and some of it not so nice. And so, um, you know, if you're only going for a one night trip once a year, not such a big deal, but if you're, going for, you know, a couple weeks or 10 days or a week even, you know, it's going to affect your comfort. So think about that as well. Okay. So it's more about comfort than really adding more warmth. It'll add warmth for sure, but how okay. much is sort of anyone's guess, you know. It's... 
And are you going to go and back? And the other thing that you can do, Cecilia, is you can always add on layers to your body. Right. So, uh, like I was suggesting, you know, the... Yeah. Are you going to go back to the base layers? Because um, I had another, like, I've somebody recommended, like, Patagonia. They're like, you know, I have Patagonia. My girlfriend has Patagonia. And then somebody else was uh, talking about Merino wool. And so those are like the two recommendations that um, I've gotten for that base layer. And so I was wondering if you, uh, all, you, I, you mentioned Patagonia already, um, but. Yeah, that was sort of the go-to, you know, like 10 years ago is uh, Patagonia. And then this, the, the actual product name slips my mind at the top of, at the moment, but uh, Merino la wool is another one that I really, really like. So I'll oftentimes, use a merino wool t-shirt you know as sort of my you know okay. go-to because um, it it is it's not itchy it's not you know hot it's actually you know just you know a nice extra layer and uh, it dries really quickly so I, I sweat a lot and so it dries really quickly and it doesn't retain it doesn't stink like a, a lot of um, synthetic materials after a few times you wear them, they really start to stink. Even after you wash them, they, it's hard to get that stink out. And uh, merino wool doesn't have that same problem. So um, merino, mm -hmm. merino wool is a, a really good choice. Okay. Capoline, I think, is uh, the, um, the material for the Patagonia uh, base layer, capoline. Okay. So I have a, a, you know, a capoline set of you know, the leggings and uh, an upper as well. And, uh, but I, I tend to use sort of just merino wool a lot of times nowadays because I'll hike in it as well. Uh, so I have, I have an opinion. I, I think it's way clothing. Uh, Terry, could you speak up just a little bit? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Is this better? It's a little bit better, yeah. Okay. So I think with clothing and materials, it's, it's something that everybody, I think everybody's body is different on what works or whatnot. And you have to try different materials and see what works for you. Um, I think I've purchased at least 10 different pairs of socks and, you know, and it's really just experimenting with the materials to see what your body accepts and and again it could be patagonia it could be arcteryx it could be any other brand but it's what will work for your body i that agree with that yeah i think you know some people the smart roll socks i darn tough i that's all i wear i tried um what are those people socks because they're cheaper there you go darn tough yeah and i got blisters so darn tough it's they're expensive, but if you rip them, they're going to send you another pair. And I will get them to send me another pair. Um, and uh, so I think I think you're right. It took took me probably a couple years to find the clothes. I've gone through hiking pants. Like I wanted to look really cool. I probably look like a dork. I these Nike shorts that weigh nothing are my backpacking shorts, and they're not cute. But if you look at them up close, there's like little holes in them and you get air and it's all good to go they work yeah, yeah you figure out what works over time yeah yeah and one more reason i guess to uh shop rei not that i'm plugging rei but um my first hiking boots i returned after six months and they put me in a pair of keens and they were perfect and i've worn those ever since but um yeah there it was really no problem returning the boots yeah. and they were dirty and they had gone you know hundreds of miles and they were just like we'll take them that's okay yeah. Yeah. so i guess it's the same thing with clothes and everything else yeah um thanks thanks yeah for highly recommended for boots and and shoes i right now i've i've migrated over time and i i don't have them in my room right now but i actually have a pair of the same boots they're, they're not the boots that I wore back in 1980 when I first hiked the John Muir Trail, but they're the same model and they weigh like four pounds, four and a half pounds each on each foot. You know, they're just these Frankenstein leather, you know, clodhoppers. They're so heavy. 
And then now what I wear are trail runners. I, and I backpack in those. And, but it's a highly individual thing. I'm not recommending that that's what you do or anything else. You have to kind of figure out what works for you. Uh, but uh, it, you know, it's so much more comfortable for me overall, even though I feel the rocks more you know, through the bottom of the shoe and that sort of thing. Uh, can I say something about the shoes too? Is I, I had a pair of Keens that I absolutely loved, bought a second pair. And I just like didn't want to buy another pair. And I looked online and I couldn't find it. But like once I sent them the question, they're like, oh, here's some new footbeds. And so I just bought new footbeds for my boots. And that has made a world of difference for me without having to purchase a whole new pair of boots. And, um, and the socks, if you get blisters on your toes in gingies are amazing. And uh, that is what helps me to hike further. I've never used those toe socks, um, but uh, I know some people, you know, that works out really well for them, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to get huge blisters like on the sides of my toe, at, like if I did a five mile hike and uh, my son actually, I was kind of like laughing at him one day cause they just looked silly to me, I don't know. And he's like, you should try them, you should try them. And I don't laugh at him anymore. I love them. They really, they just, I, I don't know. They, they made a huge difference for me. That's, you know, that's a big part of gear is, is uh, being willing to try things. And then as you figure out what works for you, then, you know, just stick with it, you know? <laughs> Um, I used to wear Keen boots for a long, long time. And then I started, you know, like my, I migrated to using these ultra Lone Peak trail runners for day hikes. And then I tried them on a four night backpacking trip. I thought, well, that's kind of crazy trail runners on a backpacking trip, but it worked out really well for me. And that's all I wear. And so I've, I'm on my fourth or fifth pair of those particular shoes. Cause I just know that I can throw them on and, and they work. And I've never had a blister and they've been awesome. So um, they don't work for every situation. I mean, they won't work for snow or that sort of thing, but they'll work well for dry conditions and, and that sort of thing. Uh, Miriam is asking the name of that mattress again. Miriam, I don't know if you're talking about the, the air mattress that I was using, which is a Big Agnes, uh, the Big Agnes Q-Core, it's called. Or if it's the, the uh, closed, foam, closed cell foam pad, this is a Thermarest Z-Lite pad. Uh, both are good mattresses. Um, obviously the air mattress is more comfortable. Um, okay, so the, the third component of sort of the basics would be your, your tent, your shelter. Um, I love, you know, when I, when I did the, the John Muir Trail the first time in 1980, uh, we were out there for 25 days and I spent every night except for two cowboy camping. Y'all know what cowboy camping is? So it's camping under the stars. You just roll out your pad and your sleeping bag and you have no tent at all. And uh, the great thing about that is that you know, there's no setup really. You don't have to go through all that. There's, um, um, and there's no tear down at the, in the morning. You know, it's really, it's, it simplifies that part of it. The flip side is that there's no protection from mosquitoes. So if mosquitoes are bad, you, you know, you're in, you might be in trouble. And I think one of the two nights that we were in tents, the place that we were camped, it wasn't rain that caused us to stay in a climb in a tent. It was mosquitoes. We were just trying to escape the mosquitoes. Um, lately, I haven't really done that. I use a tent most of the time. If I'm if I'm uh, hiking with some friends, uh, I'll tend to have my own tent. And um, I've got we've got a couple different tents, and I have one that I brought up here. Obviously, it's not set up, but um, this is sort of a, a workhouse. Um, it's a Big Agnes Copper Spur, uh, one-person tent, and it has, it's a traditional sort of tent 
a shelter in that it has, it's fully enclosed. It's got a side door, so it makes it easy to get in and out, which is, uh, you know, it's more of a consideration today than it was when I was 18. Um, and it is not the lightest. It does have a fly that you can put on over, so it's that that's, creates that double wall. So the condensation will, um, from your breathing over the night, will uh, appear on the fly, but not on the tent that you're in. And so you're gonna have less condensation in the tent that you brush up against and everything gets wet and that sort of thing. Um, Copper Spur, they have a two person, a three person, I think they might even have a four person model. Um, and so I have a, a, another friend that I've backpacked with, I did the Wonderland Trail with. He does, a, he's, he's done a trip with his brother-in-law um, almost every year. And they'll oftentimes take a three person tent for the two of them. And then they have a little space for their gear and stuff like that. And they can swat, they can divide up the, the poles and whatnot. This, because it's a one person tent, nobody's gonna carry this for me. I have to carry it all myself. <laughs> uh, but it's fairly, it's reasonably lightweight. It's, and it's a, you can't go wrong with something like this, uh, the copper spur. Um, I, I have that, I, the two person. What's that? I have the copper spur, the two person. Um, and I just, my, my husband and I were fine in it and my dog, I can't sleep in a one person tent with my dog. She's 60 pounds. And so, but for my big trip coming up, I wanted to shave some weight. So I got the, the Nemo Hornet Elite that, you know, is like one point, I think four. So it, I mean, it, it was a little over a pound, which, you know, makes a huge difference, but I love the copper spur, you know. Yeah, yeah the, uh, a couple of things that are nice about this, this tent or this style of tent, it's what they call a freestanding tent, which means that you don't have to stake it down to set it up. And you can actually, once you've set it all up with the poles in, you can actually pick it up and move it around to some other, you know, like if you want to adjust the location. And then you can stake it down in case it's windy or something like that, just so it doesn't blow away. But um, you have that ability. I have another tent. I don't have the tent here, but I have, uh, let's see if I can get that to focus on there. This is a um, Sierra Designs Tensegrity, and this is a two person tent. Um, it's super lightweight. It is a single wall tent, so there's no fly. Um, it has two side doors, which is really kind of nice. And it has a front door um, that would show, that would go in um, uh, on this side over here. And it's not a door to go in and out. It's a door where you can put your gear under that little awning and uh, you can reach through it during the night if you want to put your pack there or whatever you need to get you know, your water or whatever, you can reach through and get that. Um, the way that they save weight on something like this is that there is one small pole. Let's see, zoom in on that. There we go. On the, on the lower end where your feet are, there's one small pole that arches for the feet. In the front, you use your two trekking poles for that to hold it up. So that implies that you have trekking poles, number one. And number two, that one of your trekking poles does not break on the trip, as happened to me when I was in um, Tehepity Canyon in Kings Canyon National Park on, you know, like the middle of a five day trip. And uh, fortunately, I was hiking with two other guys, both, who, both of whom had trekking poles and did not, and they had traditional, pen, you know, regular tents. And so uh, I was able to, you know, borrow a pole at night when I had to set up my tent and that worked out, but it's something to be aware of. Yeah, Christy. Christy, oh, I think she had to go. Oh, she has to go to a meeting. Oh, oh awesome. Um, all right, so tents, questions about tents, tents or shelters? It's another I have a thing to try things. Um, when when um, my uh, my girlfriend, now my wife, when she was looking for a shelter 
for backpacking, she tried a, a bivy sack, um, a, which is, it's kind of like a tent, but it's even smaller. I mean, it basically is just, you can, you have to slide into this thing and the, the tent, when you're lying down, it's like right above your face. You know, it's, it, it's, it's like a mini tent, if, if you will. And uh, she found that that did not work for her. It was too claustrophobic. She had gotten it at REI, so she was able to return it, no issue. But um, uh, that's not something you want to, uh, you know, try on a long trip without having tested it out. Another kind of tent, um, the, my ultralight buddy, uh, Derek has a, um, a tarp tent. And it actually has a bathtub uh, bottom, so it's able. He's able to zip it up and enclose it so that you know mosquitoes don't get inside. But it's a single wall, and it's a tarp, and it uses his pole as you know his trekking pole as part of the support system for it. And it requires that it's staked out, um, which is the same as 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 the tent that I showed you, this tent segrity one. Um, it, it's not a freestanding tent. In other words, you have to stake out the sides or it's not going to stand up. That's okay most of the time, but some places you might be in rocky terrain or, you know, granite and, and you don't have a place where it's going to hold. Or like we were last year on the Wonderland Trail, we were in rain and the ground was just mushy and muddy and the stakes would just pull right out of the mud. So they wouldn't hold. And uh, he even tried tying the, the guy lines to a rock. And the rocks just eventually slid in the mud. And his tent started to just droop down over the night. And um, it was not fun for him. So something to be aware of. Uh, you know, if you're just starting out, the, probably the first thing you want to get, uh, if you're looking at a tent, is to get a uh, freestanding tent that does not require trekking poles. It's going to be a little heavier, uh, but you're going to be, it's going to be an easier, simpler system to work with. And then you can, you know, get fancy later if you, if you choose to. What are your, what are your all experiences? I know, uh, uh, Amy, you've, you've had some backpacking experience. What kind of tent do you use? I have a marmot. Um, I'd have to go grab it to know exactly which one, but it is a freestanding, so I don't have to use poles or stakes. Um, it has two side doors, which is nice. And then the way that the rain fly, if I bring it, because you don't have to, the way it sets up with the zippers is it gives you like a vestibule. So I keep my pack outside the tent, but it's still covered if it's a little bit misty because it's under the rain fly, but not necessarily inside the tent which is nice. And so then you can go out either side door. I used to have a North face with one door at like the feet or your head. And it was so awkward to get in and out on that. So I definitely like the side door option. Yeah. Side doors are the way to go, mm -hmm. especially for a two person. Well, for, for, for me, I prefer a side door, just even for a single person mm -hmm. tent, but for a two person or a three person tent, um, it's just really nice to be able to go out your own side and not just, you know, in the middle of the night, if you have to get up for whatever reason, answer the call of nature, um, you don't have to wake up your partner or your companion and, and climb over them. You know, you can just slip out your side of the tent. Mm -hmm. I had, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but I actually, I have the REI Half Dome. Yeah, um, those are good ones. Yeah, I, I backpacked. It was my first backpacking trip. We were doing 30 miles of uh, PCT. Um, I think we had like a 9,000 feet of elevation climb and it was super hot. I didn't feel the need to buy or I didn't have the time or could afford to buy a, a tent. So I just took what I had, <laughs> which that was it. Um, I bought a backpack, a backpacking backpack, which was pretty expensive <laughs> and a few other things I had to get. Um, but 
that's what I took um, for the first time. And it was not terrible. I lost just two toenails. Um, but I think just every ounce matters, you know, when you're backpacking. So if I did continue to do it, I definitely have to do my research on the Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, so, you know, one of the things you can do is ask what other, you know, people who you know, and you kind of know their style. And if you feel comfortable, like their style is kind of like my style, you know, I might like, you know, the same kind of tent or sleeping bag or whatever. Uh, so you can ask for advice from, from them. Um, most of the better outdoor uh, retailers will also have experienced people working there who can kind of guide you through the decision process as well. So that's useful. More just the expense. If, if you're, I mean, Big Agnes is a, it's a pretty, it's a pricey and it's a great brand. I actually have a six person tent for our camping trips, but like just backpacking period. I mean, unless you're going, unless you're planning to do it, is is just like if it's worth adding the expense because you can't just rent any brand for a one person tent. Yeah, and the other thing that you can do, my my dog wanted to say hi. This is Farley, everybody. He's, he's been hanging out with me. Um, the other thing that you can do is borrow gear. You know, so if you have you know, friends who have some gear, you want to try it out, you know, a lot of times, I mean, how much gear do we have sitting in our garage or in our closet that doesn't get used? You know, it's 365 days a year. And how many days does it actually get used? So um, I'm really happy to share with my friends and that sort of thing if they have a need. And that's a great way to kind of try things out without a lot of cost. I and, actually think... Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, and, uh, and then as you go with friends, you know, doing a little show and tell, you know, walk around and say, oh, what kind of sleeping bag do you have? Oh, what do you like about that? You know, how's that tent? Oh, let me see that air mattress. You know, how does that work out for you? You know, all of those little things kind of help you in your future decision process. Um, you brought up the cost, and I think that's a really important issue. Um, one of the things that I always try to look at when I purchase a new piece of gear is the cost per use. So, you know, you buy, you know, a, a copper spur tent for 300 bucks. How many time, how many nights will I sleep in this tent? If I sleep in it once, it costs me $300, $300 for one night. <laughs> if I sleep in it a hundred times, it's $3 a night. And so you have to factor that into the decision process. And, you know, the nicer, fancier gear is always more expensive, but maybe you don't need that. You know, maybe you can get by with something else and, uh, and then see if this is something you really love doing and, and you want to uh, do more of. It probably doesn't come with room service at three hundred dollars a night. I know, right? Yeah, there's no maid service to you know turn down your bed at night. You know. <laughs> I also found though, I attend my tent was expensive, the Nemo Elite, <laughs> and I knew I wanted freestanding because I had the copper spur and I had tried and not, and it just I, I wanted a freestanding, and it was it was. I'll be honest, $450. And I stocked it for like four and a half months. And one day moose jaw, 25% off. And, I, and that was it. That was the only time I've seen it on sale. So, and I did that with my mountaineering boots too, if you're patient. Cause I know me, if I don't get the one, I will use it. And if I don't get the one I want, then I end up wasting money because yeah. then I buy something else. So if you're patient, and I mean, I would look almost every day. And one day I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, Dude. yeah. yeah and the other thing to think about is renting equipment. You know, um, I know right now during COVID, I'm not sure a lot of places aren't doing rentals right now. Mm -hmm. But um, in normal times, you can go to REI and rent a sleeping bag and a backpack and a you know tent and all of those things. And it's a whole lot cheaper than buying it. Um, 
And it gives you a chance to kind of try out that gear. So you get a sense of, you know, what you like or dislike about it and what you would want different if you were to buy something yourself. So you can decide, is backpacking for me? And this is, you know, whether it's for you or maybe you have a friend who's said, oh, I want to go on a trip with you someday. That sounds like fun. You know, that might be a, a, a way for them to kind of get gear for the trip without outlaying a bunch of cash up, up front and, and just kind of mm -hmm. trying it out. Yeah, and we're only a month away from the REI Labor Day sale too. So if you can wait for a month. Yeah. And I think use gear. Um, my husband got a pair of, uh, I think, the mountaineering boots, like ridiculously cheap. And they looked, I mean, they're brand new. I, I mean, I don't know how people feel about use, but I mean, he probably saved $250. But it's the same type of thing. You have to you're not going to get it the day you look, you have to stock it. It's yeah. I'll add on the REI stuff too, actually for used gear. Um, the, it's a little bit different on the return policy right now. Obviously you have to order on the internet, get it shipped to you. Um, you they'll still take anything back, but if you, you can actually rate what you want, size, color, what it is, and then um, hit a button if it's unavailable for them to notify you when it is available. And if you get it, excuse me, in excellent condition, because they have all the rankings of it, the ones that are in excellent condition are things that people purchased, took home, said this doesn't fit me, and sent right back to the store. They won't put it back on the shelf. So I've now gotten three different pairs of shoes and multiple other things from them that still have tags on them that are brand new and, you know, maybe went out once if at all. Um, I don't think mine even hit the pavement outside for what I actually got. And two of the sizes that I got originally didn't fit me. Um, and I sent them back and paid the $6 shipping. But other than that, I still saved myself somewhere between 50 and $100 on each product and had it returned, which is insane. And I, I use Solomon's for work too. I, I use multiple things that I get from there. Keen sandals that I've gotten brand new for 30 to $40 with nothing wrong with them, never been worn as opposed to one to 150. So there's a, there's a lot that you can gain from that, but you have to get it in the excellent condition to have it brand new, basically being called used. Um, and it can, it can definitely save you money. I stand by the REI thing because I have had to return many things. And I think a lot of people save money um, to go order something and it comes and you'll keep it and use it, but it may not really be for you, but you spend a lot of time. I mean, this isn't a cheap hobby. And um, once you get it and you're stuck with it, if it's not something that was for you, now you've just spent, you know, one to $500 on something that, that is yours now and REI will fix that they'll get you back something else instead. So it's more worth it. If you buy used gear from REI, does it still have that one year return policy? No. It, I, I don't know if it's a year on the used. I think it's different. No, it's final sale. It's not final sale. Um, but it, it has a it has a date on it. I have three it, different it items. May that depend, I've done it may depend on the gear too, you know, like it does yeah. depend on the gear. Um, like if you go to the garage sale, that's what they call it, where they put all their used gear out, that is final sale, anything you get there. Um, and you can still get shoes and clothes there. You just definitely want to know I like that brand, this is my size. Um, all of my cooking gear for backpacking, I got at the garage sale, um, which was great because I saved a ton of money on that. Um, but all of that was final sale. So a lot of their used stuff definitely ask before everything brand new from the store has the one year return policy. No problem. Um, but a lot of the used stuff is final sale. I think too the garage sale is separate. So the and now the they put the garage sale online too. So just make sure that there's a whole little section for REI use. Yeah. yeah. So just be like, you know, just really cognizant before you press purchase and ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Make sure you know what the return policy is for those items and whether it's something that you've already tried. It's tried and true for you and you know that you like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I didn't really plan to talk about cooking systems, um, but I know that's probably something on a lot of people's minds for backpacking. 
And I'll just say, get a jet boil. I'm just going to say it. You know, I have a couple different stoves. I've got one of these little titanium, you know, two ounce stoves that just screws into the, the thing and you have a titanium pot on that and you can do stuff with it and it's awesome. But most of the time I take, um, I take, this, which is a jet boil minimo. And it this basically has the I've got a, a large fuel canister in there. But basically you screw this all together and it's your cook kit as well as the um your your stove and everything goes in there. So it's super super compact. And uh, it's maybe a little bit heavier than some of the other options when you can when you add up all of the other features. Um, the thing that's great about the jet boils is that it really does boil water faster than anything that I've seen. You know, I mean, it'll boil, it'll take water to boil in a minute or 90 seconds. You know, it's really fast. And so if you're cooking, you know, Mountain House or, you know, other kinds of meals where you're, just pouring in hot water and sealing it up and waiting 15 minutes. This is the way to go. It's super simple, you know, and the, the reason the Minimo is that you can adjust the flame so that if you do want to cook something, you know, like make eggs, for example, you, you don't want to just have, you know, full, full power and off. And Minimo lets you have like a simmer, you know, you can kind of, dial in how much flame there is and um and so you can you can saute something if you want to you you harvest some wild mushrooms and you put a little olive oil in there and then cook up some dehydrated powdered eggs or something and make a little you know scramble so uh that would be my recommendation to jet boil the the only downside to this is that there is a piezo starter you know like a little push button starter igniter for this thing never has worked on this not once and so i just which which is fine i mean you know, i could return it i could have returned it you know it's beyond that time now but i don't really care because i'll carry a lighter anyways you always should have a lighter and some matches as a backup because you don't want to rely on an you know the little push button starter and have it fail on you in the field so um I don't even worry about it anymore. I just have the have a lighter or have matches along with me, and that works. Um, if you want to get fancy and try to do something else, you know, you're welcome to do that. And I have all of that other gear as well, and I've used it for many, many times. But most of the time now, this is the easy button. You know, just take a uh, jet boil and boil water. And it, again, it's going to depend on what you're cooking, but um, it's the it's the easy way to go. Even easier than that, however, um, my buddy Chris Mead, he uh, just got back from a backpacking trip, um, like 10 days in the Sierras, and he doesn't bring a stove at all. So he has cold meals every meal. And, uh, you know, that works for him. And it's, you know, if you think about it, this is... This is a this is a little bit over a pound with the fuel canister in there and everything else. So um, he's saving that weight, and um, uh, but for me, I like I don't necessarily for breakfast or lunch, but for dinner, I really like having a, a nice hot meal at the end. Of, you know, or set up my tent and you know sit down and relax and and be able to have a hot meal is is kind of a nice treat for me. So. Um, you know, kind of depends on what you're used to. And maybe the length of the trip. If it's one night, I might consider going without a stove and, um, you know, save that extra weight. Um, hey, hey, Tara, what are you taking? On? You know, you've got a trip coming up. You want to tell us a little bit about your trip and, and what kind of gear you're taking and how you've dialed that in? Yes. Um, well, I got a bunch of new stuff this year because I kind of learned on the High Sierra Trail last year. People were, uh, my pack was very heavy. Um, well, not very, it was heavier than most people around me. So I, I have an Osprey. I have, and I really love it, but I did get a Gossamer gear pack 
that's lighter. And I do like, because I think I might have to take my big bear canister and the top uh, kind of latches right over it. So, um, so I like both. I usually use my own, but for, for the lighter weight, I, the Gossamer, and it wasn't, it was pretty affordable compared to some of the other lighter weight options. Um, I got a new tent. I, I bought a lot of new stuff this year to try to lose some, some weight because my intentions, I'm doing the big Seki trail in, uh, 10 days, it's 150 miles. Um, I was going to do it without a resupply because I was thinking I was so beasty <laughs> and I've been training really, really hard. But last weekend I was in, you know, in the Sierra with a big pack. When I take my, my dog eats a lot and she eats a lot without hiking. So I have to take, it's, it's a lot of weight for food and water for her. She carries a pack, but she'll carry her bed and like my liner. <laughs> so, um, so I kind I, I I'm going to have a resupply, and I had a friend, Greg Glass, actually offered. My husband just got promoted; he might do it. So I decided ten days worth of food I could do it. But why, <laughs> if I'm having people offer, you know, to bring in the five days? Um, Big Sicky is like I think I think it's like thirty six thousand elevation gain. And so day one, I'm just climbing and I'm, I could just see myself like, why didn't you <laughs> with all 10 days worth of food? And I do like to, like I saw Chris and I admire that, but I, number one, I make coffee. So a stove, mm. I, and it's, it's not even, you know, I mean, I would survive without it, but why? Because I really, it's like my favorite part is getting up when the sun's coming up with the coffee. And, uh, and I do like the hot meal at the end of the day. So uh, I got a, the thermo Thermarest, the Neolite. I, I spent some money on really lightening my- What are you issues. using for your cooking system? I got the Jetboil Minimo. Okay. And I, I have been stocking that as well. And I found there was like a flash sale. It went from 150 to 114 last week. And I just checked and it's no longer that way. So- um, if you don't need something, why not just look, you know, and wait, every day yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it's kind of exciting. I'm like, yes, I did it. Like, it's like, like this little game. So, so yeah, I'm going to leaving the 20th. I'm going to car camp and then start the 21st. And, uh, yeah. And now let, let me ask, have you try, had a chance to try all of the gear that you'll be taking? No, that's this weekend, except the tent because I'm taking my dog. Um, she, we're gonna, going to do Bernardino and, and then go over to San Gregorio and camp on the summit of San Gregorio. So everything about, except my tent, um, I'll, have, I'll have my new stuff. And my husband's going to summit San Bernardino with me, but he's going to do the day hike. So he can help carry some of the water because last time I took Mika up there, I had a uh, six liter of water. I had to carry both of our water. So that, that's, that's a big deal. I was <laughs> yep. So I'm going to try everything. The tent, I mean, I don't know how much the big ag, I think it's a little over a pound. So that, so I'll get a better sense. I'm also going to, I I'm trying new foods. Um, <laughs> You know, because I, I got, you know, getting a little creative with it because I do look forward to I'm going to have couscous with some freeze dried chicken and spinach and olive oil. So I'm going to try that out to make some of the foods. I'm actually going to try a day worth of food to kind of see how I feel about that because I want to take enough food, but I don't want to have all this extra food, you know. So that's where, you know, when you look up calorie guides, I don't, I think just like anything else, it's not accurate. You have to figure out, you know, of course you want a cushion, but when I did high Sierra trail, I probably had like three pounds of food left. And oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't eat. And I did the recommendate the caloric intake based on my weight. And I just couldn't eat all that food. I mean, I lost five pounds that week, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. 
Um, so a couple of people I've seen in the chat uh, have shared some stuff about REI being and what their policy is. So Mike, hey, thanks for, uh, Mike works part-time at REI. And so all the, uh, the, the stuff purchased in store at the garage sale is non-returnable. All sales are final, like Amy was saying, but gear purchased at REI.com slash used. So online has a 30 day satisfaction guarantee and has to be returned via mail, no in-store returns. So that's pretty awesome. And then there are some REIs are open. It really depends on, on where, um, uh, and sort of the local rules, but, uh, they're all doing, you know, additional rules inside with masks and social distancing and the number of people and all of that. So just be aware of that. Um, Sandra needs to leave. Thank you for joining us, Sandra. Looks like she's gone already. And I think we're just about ready to wrap it up. Um, there was one other thing that I thought I would talk about just in really super briefly. We didn't, it's not really specific to backpacking, but water, of course, is always a thing. And I've used different things over the years. You know, way back when I was using a Katydon, you know, a filtration system that you had to pump and it was a pain in the butt. And there were certain, you know, there were two um, tubes you had to, you know, one went into the dirty water and one went into the clean bottle and all of that. Um, this is still a Katydon but it's a uh, bee free bottle and it's just like a, you can just fold it right up. It'll collapse and it's got the filter built in to the, um, the nozzle. And so you basically can dip the dirty water, you know, fill the dirty water into this plastic bottle, S screw this on, flip the top open, and you can either, what I normally do is I have a separate bottle, um, like a, a smart water bottle or a Nalgene bottle, and I can just squeeze it into that bottle. You can also, you know, that way you can share it with other people, or if you're just by yourself, you can drink right out of that. And um, it's super fast. So I don't have to wait around. It's, it's really easy. Um, it's a simple solution. And so I like simple. You know, over over the years, this and this has been sort of my go-to. Um, I will say that over eventually the filter will get clogged. There are, you know, they have two different methods for cleaning the filter. Um, but um, and I I have actually a replacement filter for this particular one that I haven't put in yet. But um, at some point you can replace the filter if you need to, and that's not so bad. So this is a um, Somebody asked, this is a uh, Katydon, I think is the name. Let's see if I can focus on that. There we go. Katydon, and it's the Bee Free. And they make a couple different sizes. This is a 0.6 liter bottle, so it's not a huge bottle. That's why I'm, I'm bringing along other bottles. So, you know, if I have a, a stretch that I'm hiking and there's not water available for six miles or something like that. I know Tara, you've got a stretch, a couple stretches, like a six mile stretch, I think at one point where there's no water, you know, on that stretch. So you've got to carry enough water to kind of get you through that. And so I'll use that to fill those and that works out really well. There's other solutions like the Sawyer squeeze and um, I, I've also used a SteraPen, which is uses ultralight and it, uses bat, you know, battery power. So you just, it does require that you have something like a, um, a Nalgene wide mouth bottle that you can stick the, the, the light source in and swirl it around for a period of time. And it, uh, it doesn't filter the water, but it does uh, kill any impurities in the water. And I've used that very successfully. Um, but this is the one that I'm using nowadays. Jeff, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, has, has anyone experienced or or has considered? I I've used the uh, the non hydration tablets, and I saw today some. I don't know if it was powder. I went to Costco and I saw like a pack that they have for. It seems like extra 
hydration. I mean, does, does that work and somehow cut back on drinking so much water and just staying hydrated? Um, yeah, it's going to help you stay hydrated, because, mainly because of the electrolytes. So it's going to help you with your recovery and sort of, you know, I'll usually use, um, so you, normally my, my pack has two side pockets. I have two bottles, one in each, and one of them I'll use with a Nun tablet or scratch, you know, electrolyte powder, or even something like, uh, you know, some of the, the Mio uh, liquid flavorings, water flavorings that you can get at the grocery store. Right. Um, some of those have electrolytes or vitamins and that sort of thing. And you can right. carry that along, doesn't add a lot of weight, and it makes it much more palatable for me. You know, I'll drink water, you know, a lot, but you, sometimes I like a little something water different. That you're having to drink overall, period. It's I mean, not gonna. You still need to get the the water in your system, system, but it's gonna make it more. You know, the absorption will be better, and it's going to. Uh, yeah, uh, you you need some you know so sodium and some other things in there to help you okay. absorb that water. Makes sense. Cool. I've got a friend who. Uh, you know, the flip side of that is I have a friend who uh, she ran her first marathon and she had to drop out at mile 22 or something like that because she overhydrated. So she wasn't drinking electrolytes. She was only drinking water and she overhydrated. And that can be actually a dead, that can actually be deadly. I don't, there's a, a name for it. Maybe somebody knows, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, it's a, it's a thing. <laughs> and I, so, yeah. I don't know the name for it. When I was in boot camp many years ago, I was in the Army Reserves in uh, North Carolina in July, or South Carolina in July, which was a nightmare. I mean, that, that's, if, if I go to hell, that's where it's going to be. But um, they actually, Came, and they would force hydrate us like you would have to do push-ups and all of a sudden somebody died and so they came out with these electric it was awful too it was like these syrupy electrolyte stuff that we'd have to drink but because yeah you I don't always carry them with me like on a day hike but like the weather right now I always do because I drink a lot more and it does taste better too <laughs> it's like hyponatremia yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had yeah. a coworker had to uh, assist someone down off of Whitney. And they were over drank the water and basically threw out their electrolytes out of whack and it was a whole building a leader and dipping down off the mountain situation about five years wow. ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and you don't usually think about, you know, overhydrating as a problem, you know, because you know, it's drilled in our heads, you know, drink lots of water. But um there's don't run out of water. Yeah, it's not just water, but it's, you know, the electrolytes and the other things that you need to help your body assimilate it. Water toxemia, Miriam Enriquez, thank you for uh, sharing that knowledge with us. Yeah. Hey, guys, uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, next week, we're going to be back for uh, our 16th happy hour, and we're going to talk about um, big adventures. So uh, think about that, you know, what you're not, that big adventures could be anything. It's really what's big to you. And, and depending on where you're at, that could be your first backpacking trip. It could be your first peak bag. It could be, you know, for me, I've got one coming up. I'm going to be summiting or attempting to summit uh, Mount Adams in, in Washington. And um, so we'll talk a little bit more about big adventures and, you know, planning and prepping, prepping and training and all of the things that go into that and uh, making those uh, goals a reality next week. So hopefully you join us then. And meantime, have a great week, everybody. Good night. Happy trails. Happy trails. Yes. <laughs>